¿Segunda pregunta? La taula número 14. Eh, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Juan Antonio Gracia, de la empresa Ecoatmos. Nos dedicamos al tema de las energías renovables. Usted ha comentado que hemos llegado, o estamos, bueno, con una previsión de salir de crisis basada principalmente en que los gobiernos tomen medidas o limitaciones o regulaciones. Hasta la fecha, y hablo del caso de España, pues tanto al anterior gobierno del Partido Popular como al Partido Socialista, pues toda esta película de ciencia ficción basada en el ladrillo pues le fue fenomenal y los bancos, entre bancos y gobiernos, permitieron llegar hasta aquí porque nadie puso limitación y nos encontramos al final en una selva. Ante la virtud de dar está el don de, de, ante la virtud de pedir está el don de no dar, ¿no? Entonces, eh, ¿usted cree realmente, porque está diciendo que hay unos avances muy tímidos, muy cortos, respecto a esas limitaciones y a esas regulaciones, ¿usted cree que se va a pasar el tiempo y esas regulaciones no van a llegar y nos vamos a encontrar seguramente con la posible siguiente crisis que usted ha enunciado, que es a lo mejor que en unos países se va a producir y en otros van a consumir? ¿Tendríamos que a nivel también de la sociedad civil en los países occidentales, donde hay un máximo consumo, tener un concepto de mayor austeridad y no tener 50 pares de zapatos en vez de tener realmente los que necesitamos? Esta es la pregunta. Bueno, primero, déjame decir una palabra sobre la bubble en uh, uh, España uh, antes de la crisis. Um, Para mí, uh, It seemed to me that that uh, uh, it was clear, to, and to many of most observers, that uh, real estate was playing a disproportionate share in the Spanish economy, and it was not sustainable. Just like in the United States, it was very clear in the United States that we had a bubble, uh, even though Greenspan said, "Oh, just a little froth uh, on the economy." Uh, the, uh, partly because his ideology said that markets always worked, and if markets always worked, there could not be a bubble. The ideology did not allow them to see the possibility of a bubble. And so uh, the good thing about uh, many parts of Spain was there was an awareness of this, and there was an attempt to create an alternative basis of the economy green economy, technology. There were already things in, in process, but it was too slow relative to the timing of the breaking of the bubble and the disaster that, that followed. But the, one of the important lessons of this, or a couple of the important lessons, is uh, to repeat what I said before, markets are not self-correcting, or not self-correcting in ways that are uh, acceptable. The pain of, you know, eventually the bubble comes to an end, but at an enormous cost, both before in the misallocation of resources and afterwards in a gap between potential and actual uh, output. In many ways, Spain uh, only participated in an ideology that was dominant throughout Europe. Uh, in terms of bank regulation, the Spanish system of provisioning is viewed as the model for all other countries to follow. It's really, you know, it was one of the better bank regulators in the world. And many people have come to Spain to study its regulation on that part. But the real problem was that the re regulators thought that they should not intervene in the bubble. Uh, I think that was a mistake. The regulators should have said, Uh, we have to dampen the bubble. And the same thing was true about the, the Federal Reserve. In 1994, Congress gave the Federal Reserve the authority, for instance, to increase the loan to value ratio, the, the, the decrease the loan to value ratios, uh, other criteria that would have dampened the bubble. So you have mechanisms to dampen the bubble. There are other mechanisms like capital gains taxes that would have dampened the bubble. But ideologically, the right in the United States and in Europe rejected those. And the regulators 
who were of the same mindset rejected these instruments which would have served to dampen the bubble. So one of the other lessons to come out of the crisis is that markets are not self-regulating and there are instruments in the future for stopping these kinds of bubbles. Now, um, uh, um, as I said, so far, what we've done has been totally inadequate, and if we don't do more than we have done, almost surely we'll have a crisis like this one again. But next time, and it will happen probably in the not too distant future, it could be five years, it could be 15 years, but it will happen. But next time, we may not have the resources to be able to do the bailouts that we did this time. And these bailouts have been extraordinarily expensive. The cost, the fiscal cost has been extraordinarily high. And if we have another bubble within the next few years, we won't be able to afford the kinds of measures that we took this time. So that's why, to me, it's absolutely imperative that we do something to stop the next crisis. As I said, right now, we've done nothing. Going forward, it's really open. What will happen in the next, I would say, three months, four months, is going to determine whether what we do is cosmetic or real. And really, we don't know the answer. Whether it's cosmetic or real, this is really the question that we, we, we will have to see. And there's a real debate, real fight going on in the US Congress uh, over this issue and in many of the European uh, countries. The final point has to do with macroeconomic policy. Uh, as I said, just to reiterate what I said in the talk, I think the real risk right now in Europe and the United States is premature cutting back on government spending. Because if this happens, this is an old debate. It goes back in the United States uh, to the Great Depression, where we had a, uh, a debate between Herbert Hoover, who was the president when the Great Crash happened in September 1929, and he said, like many people today, we have to deal with the deficit, priority one. And then Keynes came along, President Roosevelt came along and said, no, we have to stimulate the economy, priority number one. Two very different views. For a while, it seemed that the Keynesian view was predominant. But unfortunately, the financial markets have forgotten that and have come back to the Hooverite policy that they pushed in 1929 and got the world into the Great Depression. We've had many tests of these two theories. The IMF had a test of the, what I call the financial sector theory, focus on deficits, cut back. They had tested it in Argentina. They tested it in Korea. They tested it in Indonesia. They tested it in Thailand. I can go along a long list. Every time they tested it, what happened? Disaster. China has tried the other way. Keynesian policies, funny that it's coming from China, but they're the only ones that have really studied the textbooks. China, 97, 98 crisis, they said, we can avoid the crisis if we stimulate the economy with investments. And they did that, their growth slowed down, to 7%, not bad. But the investments meant that in the subsequent years, they were able to grow at 10, 11, 12%. In this crisis, they did exactly the same thing, except the difference in this time, not only were they investments, but many of them were green investments. They created a high-speed railroad public transportation system so that their emissions would go down. And the result of that is their growth was 9% rather than the recession in the rest of the world. And their prospects of their growth going forward is even higher because they've done this investment. So to, in my mind, the lessons of that for macro policy of these experiments are very clear. 